Yes. What's going on, everybody? This is AJ Capasso here with Coventry Circle Paranormal, and I'm here with my good friend, as always. Robin from Hoffer and Paranormal. That was so flat. That was no excitement. That, you know, I, God, I am. He's, yeah. just, he's a mope, I tell you. Oh, no, just messing with you. But we are talking with the source. Thank you so much for uh, being with us and watching another episode. This is going to be a great episode. Unfortunately, we've had so many hurdles to uh, get our guest on today, but he has been so awesome to us, and we cannot thank him enough. Um, but first, before we get started, we just want to uh, do some shout outs real quick. First shout out we want to do is to our good friends at PD Region Paranormal. They have so much stuff going on. Head over to their social medias um, and check out some of the stuff that they do. It's absolutely amazing. Um, another one we want to shout out is um, Ghost Energy Drinks. Head over there. They have some amazing creepy drinks like Swedish Fish, Sour Patch Kids. I mean, you name it, they got it. Orange Cream Sickle, which I still want to try, Robin, to be honest. You know, it kind of sounds kind of well, good. I can't get that. I am over here. So I know you're right, but it's all at all health food stores like GNC, stuff like that. So if you are in America, I don't believe it's in UK yet, but I'm not too sure, like Robin has said. But they also have pre workout stuff as well. Another brother of ours is the Paranormal Consultant. Head over there. He has a great podcast with his friends, the Paracrew Podcast. We had them on uh, not too long ago, I believe last week. So definitely check out that episode and go check out their stuff. Um, one thing we do want to say is Global Ghost Hunt. The website is up. It's www.globalghosthunt.com. Registration is available right now. So teams and researchers all around the globe, join us. Go to the website. Go to the social medias and even TikTok um, and check out what we have to offer. Um, major production, major exposure for all the teams and researchers involved and the locations. Um, and that's one of the main things is keeping these locations on. Um, and keeping them going because, you know, it takes a lot to keep them up to par and not falling apart. Another one we want to give a shout out to is the P3 United States um, family. And we also want to give a shout out to the P3 UK division as well. Um, P3 program is about para unity. Uh, great, great group of people that we are with right now from the UK and United States. So go on Facebook and social media. Check out the P3 uh, program. It's absolutely amazing. Anyone is able to join it. Um, so definitely check it out if you're a researcher and you're into having a family in this paranormal field and getting away from the competition. We also want to shout out to our good friend and brother from Huntophobia on Paraflix right now, Brian J. Laverty. We could not be more happy with the success that he is having right now. He's about to be on um, the ma in the magazine Beyond the Grave talking about um, Parapose talking about Huntophobia and talking about Global Ghost Hunt, which he started and is founder of that and Parapost. Um, so that leads me into shouting out to where we are live right now. We're on Parapost Network Central on Facebook. If you like podcasts of the paranormal, please head over to Parapost Network Central. You can also head over to Parapost.net and you can even go to iOS or Android and download the Parapost app which is basically an app you could share your stuff on, uh, meet a bunch of great people, a community of paranormal researchers from all over, and, uh, you know, just, just join us. I mean, it's absolutely great. But no more delay. Robin, give our guest the proper intro he deserves. I will indeed. And hello to the V-Team Paranormal. Hey, V-Team. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Today, we have on a massive guest for us. True gentleman, a guy that I've been watching for years on end. I couldn't even tell you how many years. Anybody who's watched the uh, UK's Most Haunted on TV will know this man. <clears throat> parapsychologist, forensic parapsychologist, absolute genius in the paranormal world. Can't give him high enough regard. Please welcome everybody, Dr. Kieran O'Keefe. Kieran! Finally, we got him on, baby. Yes. Hi, AJ. How are you doing? <laughs> How is the weather over there? Here, it's real hot right now. Yeah, very hot. It's a pro. It's getting to thirty-nine. What is that in your your temperature? Ninety? Is it ninety plus? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Hot. yeah. Hot. Very yeah. hot. But can I just stop you there? Robin introduced me, and that that is by far the best introduction that I've ever had in my life because you use the word genius. 
genius right. of the paranormal. I've never been called that before. That's I, honestly, I, I tell you, I, I loved it. When I, I watched every live, every series of Most Haunted, I watched it all. And honestly, there was, if there was someone that needed to be told or needed to be, you know, debunked or whatever way you want to call it, <clears throat> you were the man for it. I used to love it because... The, you know, the one thing that, that I, I can't have as a paranormal investigator myself is is walking around and everything that happens is paranormal, it's paranormal, it's paranormal. Or uh, the word I despise is demonic. Yeah. You know, everything is not a demon. I don't care what you say. Yeah. And it's, it's good to have someone like with your knowledge that can walk around with a team like that, especially when it's on TV, and say, right, Yes, something did happen there, you know, which which maybe can't be explained, but maybe there is an explanation for it. You know, when you you were able to to measure and gauge like, you know, any drafts that were coming into a room and and things like this, you know, you, you've got to be able to do that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, all I was doing was lending, in a way, balance. And kind of a skeptical perspective but skeptical doesn't mean cynical you know and as you guys know when when we're talking about ghost hunting if anything skeptical is the best way to be the yes. fact that you you're open-minded but you're questioning the evidence that's presented yeah. to you and i think that is the case for most ghost hunters you know, and, I, and I've, I've always been a ghost hunter as well as a parapsychologist you know, and the two kind of slightly different things. But, you know, I've always gone into the ghost hunting side of things as a skeptic, questioning, but open minded, you know, and yeah, loved it. Loved my time on Most Haunted. Absolutely. Awesome. It was brilliant. I wanted to first yeah. uh, go quick. Uh, Don Kirk, Don Kirkman of uh, Kirkham. I hope I didn't pronounce that wrong. Apologize. Don Kirkham. says I'm here for Kieran. If you haven't attended any of his online programs, you are missing something amazing. I know you are happy to hear that. Um, That's brilliant. Thanks, Dylan. And to lead up, first question from one of our viewers, because we like to get all our viewers involved, um, from Shelly. She says, hi, is Most Haunted real? I figured I'd let brilliant. you answer. Yeah, why not dive in at the deep end? That's what a question right? to start with. <laughs> yeah, why not start with that question? The answer is yes. But it's yes with yeah. a caveat, because if you ask a different member of the Most Haunted crew, they might have a different answer. So, mm. yes, it's real, as in genuinely what was happening was that there was a team of people who were going into an allegedly haunted location. And that team of people had three people at the front, Yvette Fielding, the presenter, the medium, and then myself. Or in the past, it was a you know an investigator, Phil Wyman, Jason Carl. Um, so it's the three of us, but then you also had the team, which is the, the cameraman, the sound man, etc. But spending the night in a haunted location. So in, ter in terms of Shelley's question, it's real for that reason that we were genuinely investigating. It wasn't, you know, yeah. yes, you got you got 50 minutes or an hour edited down from you know, 10, 12 hours of footage, but also repeated footage because you've got lots of different visuals going on around the location. So yes, it's edited down, but it's not scripted. It wasn't prepared or anything like that. You know, it's genuinely we're going and investigating. But I think from my perspective, and a lot of viewers will know, I remained sceptical and at times somewhat cynical about some of the evidence that was captured, about some of the claims that were made by individuals on the show in terms of what they experienced. Whilst at other times, there might have been interesting things that were completely missed, where people said, oh, you know, I feel a bit weird when I walk into this room. I don't feel right. I feel a bit emotional. I'm going to stop. You know, that happened to crew members, but of course it didn't necessarily make the final cut because it's not as exciting as smash bang wallop. I've been scratched by a demon and, you know, there's Uncle Bob standing over there in the corner spitting at me. You know, I mean, the sensational <laughs> stuff makes it to TV, but the yeah. more sensational stuff doesn't necessarily make it. And actually, hidden amongst all of the experience of the crew, there might have been genuine experiences. There might have been. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll never know. But I saw some quite traumatic reactions from members of the crew to experiences they had that, that never really made it onto yeah. camera. 
Yeah. But not only that as well, Kieran, from watching it, you obviously, like they, they, you say, you had the time limit when you've done a live and it was on for three hours, which yeah. was great. But obviously, you had to have the time in the studio. You maybe had a guest or two that had to be interviewed. You had to go to Leslie or Richard Felix at the time for, you know, your historian side of it. You had the, uh, uh, what, the, the multi interactive side of it. Oh, yeah. You know, so you had all these different parts. So it wasn't just the three hours of live cameras. You always had these different bits. And then obviously when you had to relocate, you always went back to the studio while you relocated. So sure. and I think and I think well, I think the other thing is there's a difference in my mind between the live shows, Most Haunted Live, which you've described perfectly, Robin, and then the episodes. The live shows, there is that pressure and that sense of Let's go back to the studio. Let's speak to Leslie, the historian, or Richard Felix. Let's, you know, hear what the audience have to say. You know, all of that is very much pressure, and it feels like almost completely unnatural when you're ghost hunting. The episodes, at least, there was a semblance of an investigation. There wasn't the pressure of a live studio of having to finish within three hours. You stayed for as long as you wanted to, and a lot of those early episodes of most most haunted the team were genuinely staying till six seven o'clock in the morning mm. you know the whole night and doing multiple vigils you know so it felt a little bit more like an investigation albeit it wasn't controlled because you've got cameras around you've got sound men around you've got you know still got a lot of people around um mm. but it was one of those shows together with ghost hunters and some of the other shows that basically kick-started a boom oh you know. unreal right i mean it, paranormal used to be in the closet now all of a sudden it's the most mainstream thing in the world i mean i remember there was only like 2500 teams maybe 10 years ago now there's over 10 billion teams so everywhere you look um one of the things that uh, I, you said and i, I kind of forgot because i got so into um, what you were saying first i'll say shelly said uh nice psychology reply with a smile so she <laughs> loved that reply um one of the things that I want to say was uh, I was told by obviously a production team um, and also through Travel Channel as well. They, um, one of the production people that I had talked to, um, he was like, you know, it's 50 percent, you know, entertainment and then 50 percent in real investigating. Like the investigation is real, but then they sense, you know, have to sensationalize it to make it entertaining for the people in the studio. Like you were saying, you get all these eight, 10 hours of different angles and footage, but they have to lower it down to this 45 minute or hour show. And, like and I you think, said, yeah. I think, AJ, you're, you're absolutely right to get that insight on it. And I always say to people, you know, if you sat down and watched any paranormal show for an hour, what would be the most exciting thing to watch? Would it be two investigators sitting in a, sat in a haunted room for an hour when nothing happens? Which, which, let's be honest, we all know that, you know, you could be watched like watching paint dry on some investigation. So yeah. do you watch that for an hour or when it's TV there's producers involved thinking about the audience at home and going, well, we need to make this interesting. We need to think about it in like 10 minute bites and think, how can this be interesting for them? So on the one hand, you know, I'm skeptical about paranormal phenomena, especially within a TV context. But on the other hand, like you said, I get it. You know, there's a, there's a TV. It has to be interesting. It has to engage the viewer. And whilst we can be critical of a lot of the stuff and a lot of the current shows, it's also given that impetus and that kind of trigger for people to go out and ghost hunt themselves and find out for themselves what yeah. ghost hunting is all about. Absolutely. Sally, Most Haunted was the first paranormal investigation show that she uh, watched and loved it. Um, you know, it's so Thanks, Shelley. It's still great to see shows like that and also uh, like Ghost Hunters and stuff like that. Um, so <coughs> ghost, you know, a lot of people that couldn't really get into Ghost Hunters, even though it's such a great show, but it was because they really had not that much sensationalism as like, say, Ghost Adventures, you know, like, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sad that we have to go that way. But for entertainment purposes, I mean, like you said, you're not going to sit and watch Paint Dry, you know, so I no. totally get it. Totally get it. I think I think in the in the UK and the US the difference between all of us as well is, from my view anyway, that you know the, the, there was nothing really like this over here. There yeah. was there was you know there was absolutely nothing. <clears throat> then most hundred come on the scene, and it just blew up. It just went you know 
because of, they were doing the lives and stuff, and it was something different to what, what was ever being shown on TV. Mm. And it was like, it, it grabbed my attention. The first time I ever seen it, I was thick, flicking through the channels one night, and they were walking about, had the night vision cameras and stuff on. And straight away I thought, right, you know, you look at a screen in this dark room with a night vision camera and you think, I haven't seen this kind of thing in TV before. You start watching it, you start getting what it's about. And before you know it, three hours has gone by, the live ends, and you're still sitting watching it. And it's like, right, you know, there there was a, there was a, a, a gap in the market for this. And it leads, you know, it leads on to, you know, different things. Like, for instance, in the States, I don't know, AJ, you can correct me here, but I think Taps was was one of the first ones, wasn't it? Well, yeah, the ghost hunter team. So, the so then, so then, no, nobody really knows, or or is is that much interested in the actual ghost hunting thing because, you know, it's like it's a small sort of clique of people that do it around the world, but something like this bursts onto the scene, and it captures those people's imaginations, and all of a sudden you're like, I want to do that. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like. And I think that then, obviously, when most haunted them went stateside as well. Uh, you did Eastern Eastern Penitentiary, didn't you, Kieran? Yes, Eastern State Penitentiary, which is one of yeah. my favourite locations based in um, Philadelphia, and also West Virginia State Penitentiary. But the um, Eastern State was the one where we did the live show. Yeah, yeah. So that was amazing. It's interesting what yeah. you say about shows of that type and Most Haunted being the first, and Shelley saying we started a trend i think i think you're right and of course you've got to remember you know the Stephen, um uh carl and yvette were the ones that started it and it started with jason carl as the investigator before i joined a few years later interestingly that was 2002 um ghost hunter started a year or two after that so the taps guy started a year or two after that and there was something about the show as as being a televised investigation yeah. There were elements of it that had happened before in a, in an American context and also in, in kind of a, a, a British context. In the U.S. context, you rewind about two years and you have a show called MTV Fear. So yeah. it's a show called Fear where effectively it was almost like a game show mm. in, a, in a way, but it was, but it was, you know, contestants like a group of five or so people left in a haunted house or haunted location for a period of days and you know, things happen to them or CCTV happening or those sorts of things. Um, but they had moments where there were night vision cameras or CCTV. That was 2000. But then you can even go further back and Robin will know this, the show, the one off show Ghost Watch. I, I, yeah, I've, on, I've heard of it. I've never yeah, seen it. it happened yeah, on actually, BBC. It was a one-off, um, yep. a one-off show, and it was basically the premise of it was an investigative team led by a blonde-haired presenter, accompanied by a medium and a, um, an investigator, going into a haunted house, and occasionally they they'd go back to the studio where there'd be a skeptic sitting on a sofa, maybe with a historian. And you start to describe it and go, well, that's Most Haunted Line. And that happened about seven or eight years prior to Most Haunted. Actually, no, a lot longer than that, even dec a few decades. The, what I'm trying to say is the shows before that came across as entertainment. Yeah. When Most Haunted and Ghost Hunters came yeah. along, I think what captured the imagination was it felt like you were watching people who could be oh. you or I investigating. Yeah. And people were looking at it going... That could easily be us. These aren't special people. These aren't famous celebrities. These aren't contestants in a game show. These aren't actors. These are just real people investigating. This is cool. I would love to go and do this. You know, yeah. and I think that's what right. captured it. Maybe it was that element. It was that element of realism. I think yeah. at the start as well, though, uh, Kieran. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in the first uh, few lives and stuff, well, definitely the first one that I seen. There was uh, a lot more time given back then in certain areas, should I say. Like it, when, when obviously when they're doing a walk around, I found that, you know, towards, uh, I know most haunted are still going online, but towards the end of the living TV era of it, there was, uh, you know, you'd been walking 
maybe from one room to another, and it would have cut back to the studio for a bit, and then would have come back to you when you're in that room. Whereas when I started watching it, you know, there was a lot more time given. If you were in a room, there was a lot more time given to the investigation in that room. Mm. And then if you walked from there to another room, it was all really, it was all sort of live as well. There was, it wasn't as much studio time. And I think that's what caught me because it was like, you're, you're watching something, well, me personally anyway, I'm watching something on TV that I've literally never seen before. I'm not only have I not seen it before, but it's not recorded, it's live. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. if something happens, you know, and, and, and you see it on TV, if there's a, a chair moves or something, it's like, it's not, you're not thinking to yourself, right, well, that's, it. you know, it's like, that just happened because it's live. Yeah. And that's what really, what really intrigued me to start with was the fact that it was being done live. Yes. And I guess the key, the key thing is, you're absolutely right. At the time when it started, 2002 and then Ghost Hunters 2004 and with the live shows that they both did, it was happening at a time where live was almost unique. It was almost reserved for sports events, maybe, and that sort of thing. Now, when we talk about shows being truly live or being live streamed as we are, you know, live streamed on YouTube, through Facebook, through any social media platform, it's almost, yeah. you know, it's not apathy, but we just kind of go, yeah, it's nothing special you yeah. know, to have that. But I think you're absolutely right, Robin. There was something about that time that, that it was that live sense of you're following the action with less yeah. cutting back to the studio. You're, less, you're just going, wow, this is happening right now. You yeah. Know, this is absolutely amazing. And especially I remember... We did a Halloween special at um, a place called uh, Clitheroe, which is associated with witches in a particular area of England. And um, on on the particular night, we were at a place called Tyndale Farm. And everybody asked me about my favourite episode, and that was one of it. It was a live episode. And we're at Tyndale Farm, and over the course of about an hour... We went from a crew of thir 12, 13 standing in the room witnessing kind of a, a seance type um, setup. 12 or 13 of us was reduced down to about three of us because people were fainting, were collapsing, were overcome, were difficulty breathing. It was just the moment just kind of caught everybody. Oh. And it was, it was a lot of it made of it being paranormal. And everybody else thinks it's paranormal. I had my own reasons as what I think was going on as always skeptical explanations but it was just one of those moments where people got excited because they're going this is actually happening the cameraman has just fainted and the cameras crashed and basically yeah. you got dead air for yeah. two minutes it was just a black screen on people's tvs at home when they went what yeah. wtf what just yeah. happened <laughs> you know? yeah amazing Amazing time. I, I had a little bit. I must. I must admit. I'm going to hold my hand up here. I had a little bit of a <clears throat> of a thing. What I used to do was, I uh, went to a lot of the locations that most haunted have been to that are in my in my vicinity. As in, I've been to Clitheroe quite a few times with the castle keep in the hill and stuff. Oh yeah. And uh, all over Pendle Hill, I went to uh, Lower Wellhead Farm, parked the car, went partly up the hill. Stuff yeah. like that, because obviously it's quite near to me. It's quite local. <clears throat> but my favourite place, and I know obviously we're going to talk about more than most haunted on this, but my favourite place that that you did, and I want to go to, was Woodchester Mansion. Oh, fantastic place! Amazing, amazing place. So for 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 those not familiar with Woodchester Mansion, effectively you've got this old mansion and what makes it truly unique is from the outside it looks complete it looks like a stunning i was i more think about it looking like a cathedral but it's this enormous mansion from the outside looks fine but on the inside it's just nothing basically is it you know you've got the yeah. floor place but there's actually not it's almost like an empty shell of a place but also to get to it you're going down a drive you know, and it's kind of like it, it's an archetypal horror journey, isn't it? To go down the driveway as you get to Woodchester, Woodchester Mansion. No, it's it's absolutely 
brilliant, brilliant place, brilliant place. Can I just ask you as well, Kieran, while we're on the subject, and then the the the, the part in that mansion when you, uh, I think is we're in the in the loft part of it. Hello, Bran. And there was a there was a stone thrown, wasn't there? There was a rock or something thrown across yes. camera. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which was which was which was brilliant because it was caught on camera. Yeah. So it was one of those moments, and I think yeah, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I can almost think I, what I would have said is how impressive it was because we finally got one caught on camera. Typically, what happened in that's in those sorts of scenarios is you just hear it. It lands, and then you maybe you're able to film it, but you're able to see it go across the camera. The issue, of course, with it, as I said, with any objects that are flying, is if we've got footage of where it starts mm. and we get the trajectory and where it finishes, then that's mm. impressive. So we can see the starting point. We didn't yeah. get the starting point at Woodchester Mansion. We got it flying through the air, but we don't yeah. know where it started from. Did it start um, from unseen hands or yeah. did it start from seen yeah. hands? Yeah. And bearing in mind as well for anybody that's watching, when that when this is happening, you are in the pitch pitch black, pitch dark. Yeah. So you can actually discount that someone could be over that way. Yeah. But still, it it is impressive. There was that one, and there was one near the start when uh, I was talking to Richard Felix about it when he was on, where they were in a basement of a of a I think it was a farmhouse, and. Richard Felix and David Wells were sat at a table asking it to move, and the table actually shot into Richard Felix. You mean <clears> moved, <throat> moved apparently of its own accord into Richard? Yeah. I wonder where that was. Because I if it was David Wells, it wouldn't have been very, very early on, because I think it was no. a few hours before he joined. <clears throat> I think it was I think it was quite early in his uh in his tenure there. Wow. Yeah. Table phenomena always intrigues me. I was going to get into huge arguments with people about table phenomena. Yeah. Just don't touch the table. And then if it moves, I'll be impressed. Yeah, no. Yeah. I totally understand. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, it's funny because you have to be, if you're an investigator, you have to be skeptical. I mean, as much as when you're in this for so long, you obviously get that thing where it's like, okay, you know, I know this is spirit, but you can't, you kind of can't get like that almost because, you know, then you start, you know, not debunking things that you should. Um, one of the things I, I, I do want to ask, I do kind of want to switch gears real quick because we are going to have you on again. Um, we only have an hour with you today, um, which we greatly appreciate. But I want to switch gears. Um, first, I just want um, to say a couple <clears throat> That Dawn just said, she said, I've done a couple of investigations at the place you just mentioned, had a couple of cool experiences, but what made people scream was a mouse that was running across the room. And then uh, Stuart said um, he used to be a part of a paranormal group and he did, um, they did Woodchester um, as it is down the road from them. And uh, it's an amazing place. And he said they did, they did deliver a couple, um, which did deliver a couple unexplained events. Um, but one thing I did want you to um, talk about a little bit was how you got into this, how you got into what intrigued you to be in parapsychology like, and what was an experience that you had that maybe forced you into this or got you into this, um, field, if you don't mind asking. Yeah, that's. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a a brilliant question. I guess very very early on, um, my parents were genuinely concerned about my reading material. I was fascinated by ghost stories, mm. and I even as a young boy, I was reading the works of M. R. James, H. P. Lovecraft, James Herbert, the UK oh. author, Stephen King, even some of his short stories, Clive Barker a little bit later on. So there was something that I was fascinated by ghost stories. But then fast forward, and I was a voracious watcher of paranormal documentary type things. So there was a show, Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, that was around when I was a very young teenager, so 11, 12 years old. So I loved that. But then actually the turning point for me was 1984, age 13, and the movie Ghostbusters came out. Mm. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was it, you know. I had never had any aspirations prior to that to be a parapsychologist. And that film came out when I was 13, and I thought, no, that's what I want to do. I want to be a parapsychologist, you know, and hoped that I, one day I would be like Dr. Peter Venkman and oh, yeah. have my proton pack and all oh, that jazz. You know, it would have been so cool. But yeah, so uh, even to the point where 
after finishing school, I made a conscious decision to go to university in the States so I could study parapsychology. It's very difficult to do that in the UK and you know in, in Europe. But actually in the US, there are a few places that are more open to studying parapsychology. So yeah, so I ended up studying at a university out in the States and spending some time at the Institute of Parapsychology or what's known as Ryan Research Center. But yeah, that was the key. That was the key for me is, is Ghostbusters. And then as a teenager, you know, the odd ghost hunt here and there and that whetted the appetite. And I just thought, this is what I want to do. That's so great. I could totally kind of see uh, your parents being a little concerned about your reading material. H.P. Lovecraft, <laughs> definitely, you know. He was a great, great writer. Exactly. So I, um, I <clears throat> want to say what Shelly said real quick. She, she first asked, do you guys have any Australian paranormal investigators in me and Robin do know Night Watchers of Australia. Um, that's on Paraflix. Um, how about you, Karen? Do you know any um, teams from Australia by chance? Yeah, there's there's um, is it the API, which which is actually the Australian Paranormal Investigators, which I think are based in Brisbane, okay. and uh, there's a um, uh, a researcher as well called Sarah, and I always get her surname wrong. I think it's Sarah Chuma Chumaka. Sarah Chumaka, I think is her, her surname, but she, she writes a blog, kind of a, a regular blog, and does fantastic research. And the blog is always about things that you need to know as a ghost hunter. Mm. So why are we interested in temperature, for example, or why do we use an EMF meter, or what's the best ghost box to use, and that sort of thing. And she's very, very active, and I recommend people digging out her her blog but yeah it's it's actually quite active in australia there are quite a few investigators quite a few groups there mainly centered around brisbane area and sydney and i think a couple in melbourne but yes yeah, relatively relatively um active in terms of uh, investigators awesome shelly also asked which you already answered basically but she did say how did you get into parapsychology which you just actually answered um and our sir i mean our our sister and part of our, our uh, paranormal family uh sarah sario said hello uh dr sierra um so, hi that's me waving and uh <laughs> I, I i wanted to ask is there was there um actually you know what first thing i want to ask is did what is to explain parapsychology to someone that doesn't quite really understand that kind of just knows the term but can you explain it a little Yes. So very basically, it's the scientific study of the paranormal. The issue is, what is the paranormal? It's mm -hmm. huge. It's a vast, vast subject. Yeah. Parapsychology does not study all of it. It doesn't look into yetis, UFOs, mm -hmm. alien abduction, Loch Ness. It focuses on a particular area of the paranormal, and that is three areas. The first is ESP, extrasensory perception, which covers things like telepathy, precognition to predicting the future. The second area it covers is PK, which is psychokinesis, which is the action of the mind on an object. And then the third area of study is after death communication or survival, basically. And it's things like hauntings, mediumship, poltergeist, that sort of thing. So those are that's the main focus of what a parapsychologist is interested in. Awesome. Awesome. AJ, so look who's on. I know. I just wanted to say, so Robin's wife, uh, Julie, um, she just said hi and hi to you as well. And I'm sure she's what, downstairs, Robin, or in the other room? Yep. She's downstairs <laughs> watching because she's another one. It was always me and her what's most haunted. And she loves Karen really. as well. Yep. Hi, Julie. <laughs> so, uh, Robin, go ahead, <clears throat> ask friend, please. I was just going to, I was just going to say, is there, is there anywhere uh, in the UK, Karen, that that you haven't visited that you would love to go to do a ghost hunt, whether it, you know, obviously you've done, you, you've practically rinsed the UK with most haunted. Yeah. There are, there are still places left, you know, in the UK and in North America. So in the UK, my dream location is the tower of London. Ooh, that's you know, cool. when you think about locations, absolutely. That would be a key one is is the tower of london you know if you rewind back about 20 years very few people remember it but halloween about 20 years ago bef just before most haunted or maybe just the year before most haunted was started there was a live ghost hunt from tower of london um and 
it happened it was interesting maybe not the most engaging show but unfortunately the the crew and the team involved did not do what they should have done and they didn't adhere to the rules of the tower of london and it's almost as though from that day the tower of london shut its doors to investigations which is a you know a, annoying to say the least so tower of london definitely in the uk in north america there are so many locations so many locations but we covered quite a few and i've done investigations over there i actually did investigations as well with um uh the taps guys as well quite a few years ago 15 16 years ago we did an investigation um in northern florida at the time but oh, i've always wow. wanted i've always wanted to go to alcatraz Oh, but, oh, me too. That seems like such you know, a great go to, yeah. Amazing location. I was very close to there when we did Winchester Mystery House. Oh, which don't. Was kind oh. Of <laughs> Stop it. a dream right there to go there. Is that a dream? Really? That's, to my, go there? that's my ideal location. Oh, it's superb. Absolutely superb. So, yeah, we were there. San, Is it San Jose in California? Yes. Yeah, it is, yeah. Jose. Yeah, which is just down the road from San Francisco where Alcatraz was. And I'm just kicking myself that I didn't stay a few extra days and go and spend some time at um, Alcatraz. But Winchester Mystery House, what a place. What an absolute place. And I remember the walk up to it. So I hadn't seen it. I'd seen it online, but hadn't visited. You know, I arrived in San Jose, got over my jet lag <clears throat> the first day, walking up the road to see the Winchester Mystery House. And as I approached kind of the front of it, it was a surreal moment because I, I bumped into an actor who I have the greatest um, admiration for, Giovanni Ribisi. Oh, and wow. this actor was just standing there in the front of Winchester Mystery House. And I went, oh, hi, Giovanni. And he went, high and then just walked off and i thought this is surreal here's a location that i have seen and thought how amazing would it be to investigate and i'm almost being greeted at this winchester mystery house by this amazing american celebrity giovanni and then now. Walked... me now <laughs> <laughs> exactly but then walked into the house and you're right you know robin in terms of your excitement i was it was like being a kid in a toy shop it was just phenomenal absolutely phenomenal really was i spent quite a bit of time there when we weren't filming just walking around with my jaw open just going yeah i cannot I believe you, aj i used to like kieran <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you know, that place just the construction of that place and yeah. the way that was built is just mind-blowing i mean you know, it's yeah. amazing that it's amazing that uh, she didn't get sent to the, the lady she, when she was building it. It's amazing they didn't put her in a nut house. To be completely yeah. honest, you know, yeah. back in the days, I mean, the, the house is just absolutely amazing from what I've seen from videos and stuff like that. I haven't got to go there, which I, I would love to go there. I just haven't had the chance. Um, but I tell you, it's 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 absolutely amazing, like you said, and that seemed like such an awesome experience to have. Amazing. Um, and I picked up I picked up an old 1930s, was it 1930s, 1920s postcard of uh, the Winchester Mystery House there as a souvenir. And when myself and my wife, we had our second born a little girl, when she got to about the age of, I can't remember, four or five, we were looking at the postcard thinking, should we, should we sell this, you know, sign it and sell it? Is it sort of thing somebody might? And then we're like, well, no, maybe we shouldn't, not sure. And then... Um, my little girl came along. Yeah, she was about four or five, and she just pointed, pointed at it, went, "Who's that lady?" And we went, "What? What are you talking about?" And it was just a photograph of the house, nothing else, just the house. She pointed. She went, "Who's that lady?" And we went, "What are you talking about? What lady?" And she pointed at the window of the upper floor and went, "That lady there. Who's that?" The lady oh. in white. And we had been looking at this photo, I kid you not, for donkey's years, never seen anything. And she pointed at the window and there looked like the outline of this white lady. And at that moment, we said, no, we're never getting rid of that photo. No way. Wow. Yeah, no, Do you believe it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Winchester? Yes, of course, it was Elizabeth Winchester. And I'm a believer in all things paranormal. And Winchester Mystery House is the greatest haunted location there ever was. I'm being sarcastic. It was, uh, it was, it was yeah, definitely a lady. 
it was definitely a lady. We just don't know who it was. Genuinely don't know who it was. But it's just weird. We had never noticed it before. And then there was that creepy moment when our four-year-old said, oh, yes. That not that wild, huh? I'm, yeah. I want to ask you about that later. But uh, first, Sarah said, love you in the Ghostbusters video made by Dylan Jones. Back off, man. I'm a parapsychologist. That, that's exactly. awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Do check that out. Dylan, Dylan Jones, there's a couple of documentaries. So Dylan Jones did a documentary where he interviewed a couple of parapsychologists about why they got into parapsychology to mark the release of Ghostbusters Afterlife, I think it was. It was kind of a special release that he was commissioned to do this documentary. And yeah, I'm one of them. He interviews me about Dr. Venkman and Ghostbusters and all of that. That is so cool. Shelly uh, just actually asked, she asked a couple of good questions. She said, as a parapsychologist, do you think that spirits, energy, ghosts will ever be scientifically proven in any way? And after all that you have experienced, are you less of a skeptic or just still the same you were when you first started? That's a, it's a, a brilliant question. I'm going to flip that question on its head and say, Please. first of all, first of all, no. As in, I don't think they'll ever yeah. be scientifically proven. But I'm going to flip it on its head and say, you know, are there parts of it that will be disproven? As yeah. in, as in... As scientists, and let's be honest now, I've done a lot of research on on the environment, looking at electromagnetic fields, humidity, temperature, air pressure, um, infrasound, all of these sorts of things, all of these environmental variables, but also the psychological side. At the moment, really, as a science, we're in a place where we can reliably say, you know what, there's good alternative explanations for what's going on. Mm. But there isn't one explanation that can explain it all. It all you're, yeah. presented, you're presented with particular ghostly accounts, and you can maybe explain some of it away using this particular explanation. You get presented with a different account, you'll have to give it a different explanation. But fundamentally, as a science, we're still in that position of going, you know what? Science can't explain yet what ghosts are. You know, if anything, what we should be doing as parapsychologists is battling with mainstream science because mainstream science, a lot of mainstream scientists will turn around and go, you know what, people that see ghosts, it's either fraud or they're hallucinating. And to be honest, that's just complete rubbish. That yeah. is complete rubbish. We know thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are having these experiences worldwide from loads of different backgrounds, educational backgrounds, gender, race, work, age, you name it. And they're not all hallucinating and they're not all faking it and saying, oh, you know, just joking around. There's mm -hmm. something else going on. We've got to accept the fact people are having these experiences and people a lot of the time are genuinely moved by these experiences and even sometimes traumatized. So they're having these real experiences. And I think we just need to do more to understand exactly what's going on. And that's yeah. why it's a lovely question, Shelley, because ultimately will science ever prove that ghosts you know will exist no i don't think they will i think the proof of such things is your own is personal encounters yeah. when people talk about having a ghostly encounter and they explain it to me and they say well what do you think i say well it could be this it could be that it could be this like it could be that sort of thing but you know what the moment's gone you had that experience. I wasn't there when you had the experience. I wasn't there. So all I can do is offer alternative explanations. If you then still walk away and go, no, actually, I think it was genuinely a ghost. There's nothing I can say about that. It was your own experience. And I think that's where the best proof comes from. It's your own personal experience. And it can be subjective, as in you experience and feel it, or as I know in terms of your investigations, it can also be a personal experience, but something that you witness as yeah. in the use of a gadget or a ghost box or something to get communication. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a great question. And and the last part was, am I less, less of a skeptic? Mm. Which is, <laughs> which is uh -huh. a, a really good question. I would say, um, no, I'm not less of a skeptic in fact I'm, i would say i'm more skeptical but actually what i've become is more sympathetic and empathic towards people so i've always been sympathetic i'm always a nice guy but but 20 20 30 years ago when people tell me their experiences i would already be thinking about alternative explanations 
But now having been through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of locations and investigations, I've witnessed people having what they feel like a genuine experiences. And I'm That's sympathetic to that. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't ever want to dismiss people's experiences as being somewhat, you know, some scientific explanation because people are genuinely moved by the experience. And I think, you know, that's really the best answer for Shelley is I haven't necessarily become less sceptical, but I've become more sympathetic that people are having these experiences, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think it's great to have that on your team because my team that I have is only a small team and uh, my mother-in-law is actually on the team and she's my sceptic. She believes in it. She believes 100% in the paranormal. But unless someone walks up to her face and goes, hello, then, you know, I mean, she, she's one of these ones. It has to be, <clears throat> it's never going to be, like like you say, scientifically proven. But if someone is filming and one appears in front of them and walks away or whatever, you know, you can, you can stand there and say, right, that is real. That just happened. And I think with a lot of people, not just her, but with a lot of people, this is what it's going to take for them. Yeah. It's not going to take an experiment where you use a thermal imaging camera and say, right, well, there's a different color there. There's something, mm -hmm. you know, it's all blue, but there's a heat signature in there. Or it's not going to take a K2 moving from green to red and stuff like that. There's a lot of people out there that it's going to literally take a ghost to basically walk up and slap them in the face. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. But can I just say... I've been involved now in research in the paranormal since a young boy. So we're talking almost 40 years now. And I've encountered some very weird and wonderful things. I have never heard of a paranormal investigative team with a mother-in-law on it. I was just about to say that. <laughs> that is truly to unique. Oh, is the first. Yeah. That's truly unique. Right? Isn't that? That's yeah, what I my thought. hat's off to you, Robin. That's brilliant. You know, I know. Look, you're <laughs> it's crazy. I, I totally get it. I love it. You know, they're, they're really Come close. on. I'm an Irish man living in England, so I've, I've got to have something weird about it, haven't I? True. You've got uh, to give it the Irish. <laughs> exactly. um, so I, I tell you what, man, I'm about to just sign off and let Shelly just start asking. I come put her on and start asking questions because she's got some great, <laughs> great, great questions. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I want to kind of um, move this one because this is kind of a question that I had as well. But um, from all of your work over the years, um, what is your perspective on what's going on in this field? If you can enlighten us to what your perspective is on this and your opinion on this from your research. And what is some things that have been unexplainable to you that you just have it, it's head scratching moments like we were talking about earlier? Brilliant. I mean, there's a lot in there, Shelley, in terms of my perspective. So there's my perspective on on um, ghost hunting and the kind of the ghost hunting field, but also if you look, I I make my research publicly available so people can click on it's called a research research gate page. And people can click on that and they can find my academic articles there. And recently I published an article with a number of other researchers looking at environmental explanations for ghostly experiences and basically looking at the last 20 or so years of research that's been conducted into things like electromagnetic fields, infrasound, humidity, um, you name it, any of the environmental explanations we normally put forward. And even though we went into it in great depth, what we actually found was that the research is just not there. For us to say hand on heart, you know what, some of these environmental explanations are good suspects for what's going on. The research isn't there. We have to be as sceptical about some of the environmental explanations as we are about the ghost, ghostly experiences. So so that's one perspective is I'm truly sceptical in, in the, the sense of the word of being open minded, yeah. open minded, but questioning. So I'll even be open minded and questioning the skeptical side of things as well, you know, so happy to, happy to do that. So that's kind of the perspective side of things. Shelley was also asking about my experience. So 
you said at the beginning, AJ, in terms of you know how I got into all of this. Well, of course, what I didn't say is I, I have I do have two hats. I have a parapsychologist hat, which is my scientific research, which I do at Buckinghamshire New University, where I'm based. I publish, I write books. You know, people can see my research. But then I also have a hat, which is a ghost hunter hat. I'm still thinking like a parapsychologist, but I'm a ghost hunter like yourselves. I'll go out and investigate whether it's with TV or not. It doesn't matter. Just love investigating. And and being in those situations has put me into a couple of head scratching moments. And I think that's the best way of describing it. People would say, hi, Kieran, you're being non-committal. But no, actually, when you think about all of the research and all of the training I've had, for me to say that there have been head-scratching moments is quite something. One of them was at a, a an old abandoned nightclub um, in the northwest um, of England, kind of around the Liverpool area, Merseyside area. And in this particular nightclub, a, a number of staff had reported phenomena happening and the trigger was them having a seance in the middle of the nightclub when it would all close down. And things started happening, fire exit doors opened their own accord, a shadow um, walked across that somebody saw. Um, investigated it over over you know a significant period of time and there was a local group parascience as well that investigated it actually for a couple of years you know um kind of strictly a, almost weekly basis gathering data which is a fantastic way of doing things they invited me along um and on this particular night the the staff were there uh, that were there on the original first night when the sales happened and they floated the idea of doing the seance again, kind of replicating it so we could see where people sat, all of that sort of stuff. They sat down and they did the science and I was filming with a thermal imager. So it wasn't filmed for a TV show, but I was filming with a yep. thermal imager just to look at relative temperature. I always set it to black and white yep. so that if there's any drop in temperature, you're seeing it in green. So in instantly you can tell. And I was filming a black and white. And after about 20, 30 minutes, people sat around the table and went, oh, it, feels, it doesn't feel like there's anything there. You know, maybe it's just not the right time. And I said, well, look, yeah. carry on for another five, 10 minutes. You never know. It's a, you know, a unique opportunity that you're all here. What I didn't tell them was that out the corners of the screen, it was like a green fog that was approaching the table. But it was this obviously drop in temperature, but it was kind of coming across the floor towards wow. the sounds and i was looking at it going well there's a breeze of some sort that's approaching i said just give it five ten minutes to see what happens after a few minutes they said oh it feels like the energy is building up it feels like there's somebody here and we're getting in contact with somebody and as they were saying it this kind of weird green fog was approaching and and kind of wrapped itself around the sounds table and just hung wow. there hung there for about 20 minutes whilst they were doing the seance and then at some point somebody said oh it feels like the atmosphere is changing now it feels like you know there's nothing really here and they were saying it as the fog just went and oh, just disappeared and those, it's a head scratching moment yeah you know, when you've got false validations is amazing exactly so there was that and then the other one was an old second world war german bunker on the island of guernsey that i investigated with my wife and first of all we went there just alone with keys to it and we locked ourselves in and she was sat in an outside part because she was a little bit freaked out by it in an outside part i went in with a camera kind of doing a recce and walking around and a huge kind of network of corridors dark corridors with pitch black and at some point i hear her call out and i hear her say kieran 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 and then i hear it escalate into a shout yeah. so i ran back to where she was and bear in mind you know it took about five minutes or so to run back to where she was because of this network of corridors in the pitch black when i got there she was white as a sheet she said she'd been sat down outside but within the fenced area and she heard footsteps approaching her wow she said kieran is that you the footsteps stopped shuffled and she said kieran and looked around the cor corridor to where the, the foot sounds were and there was nobody there and that's when wow. she screamed out and called out and it took me five minutes to then get back to where she was and it was one of those moments where you just go well, i didn't have the experience but I know there's nobody in here because we had the keys to it. There's no way of getting into a second world war bunker. You just can't do it. You know, this place was completely locked down. Yeah. And yet she heard it to the extent where she thought it was me 
approaching it so you know just one of those things we end up investigating it ourselves with a group and filming it and putting it on youtube because we were so fascinated by this location such a creepy location so there you go there's a couple of head scratching moments amongst the hundreds and hundreds of investigations so yeah i'm grateful for the question shelley I know we're coming almost to the end. We got like about five minutes left. First thing I want to say is Ella Jace, um, you've asked, can someone please view this video? The voice says, are you safe? Whatever you captured, if you'd like, um, I know Mr. O'Keefe, I, I, I don't know if you're that too busy. I might, I could send it to you, uh, whatever. Um, but Ella, yeah, I can please, pass it on to others. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Ella, um, email us the thing at talking with the source at gmail.com and we will take a look at it. We'll send it to, uh, Kieran, as well and he could send it out to some people as well and we can all get back to you um that's so great that you would do that for us karen as well and take a look at it as well so thank you so much um first thing i want to say is uh matt from paranormal consultant one of our brothers on the p3 program and a global ghost on everything says uh what's up to you and everybody and um also doofus davis he just happened to stumble upon this and he says hi karen he loves you. So I absolutely love that name, by the way. Doofus Davis. I mean, you can't go wrong. Brilliant name. Love it. I thought it was you and your other kind, AJ. <laughs> I know, right? That's what I thought, too. Um, but so um, one last question um, from the viewers real quick. And then I want to uh, just ask you one quick question, if you could just answer it um, for, sure. uh, for, the, for the beginners and people even that are been in this field for a while, like myself. So the first question or last question from the viewer I wanted to ask before we let you go is, Question for all of you, really, do you believe that Ouija boards actually clear up um, spirits or anything else? Um, the, if all my, yeah, all my answers have been quite skeptical so far. As in open-minded, you can see that I'm not the real cynic that I might be painted uh, as being. But actually, with this, I'm, I'm more cynical with Ouija boards. And there's a number of different reasons. So... Um, Ouija boards, when they were originally developed, if you look back, you know, to about 100 years ago, within psychical, what's called psychical research in the UK and even in the US, investigators then were using Ouija boards to tap into the subconscious of people sitting around the table. They mm. genuinely used it as a tool, recognizing there might be stuff in there that you have genuinely forgotten. And the Ouija board is a way of bringing that information out of your subconscious. So nothing paranormal, but a useful, almost almost hypnotic tool yeah. to bring that information out. So that's the first part that kind of raises the skeptical side of, of what I've done, but also on Most Haunted. You know, I've done it before with lots of other groups, but on Most Haunted, we did an investigation of a haunted mills, this huge building in, I think it was Yorkshire, where they did a seance and they came up with this incredibly accurate information on the Ouija board. All of them sat around the Ouija board. Um, and then they said, Kieran, you must be impressed with this. And I said, well, let me just, you know, tackle this point. Do you have to be touching the board and the planchette for this to work well we have to be touching the planchette i was told okay but yeah. do you have to see the board well no we don't because it's the spirits using the planchette mm. and so i said well let me blindfold you and then do it again and i'll be impressed and they said okay yep yeah, that's fine so we blindfolded the whole most haunted crew that was sitting around the seance table they did it again i said we're going to ask the same questions and i'm going to keep the answers so asked exactly the same questions the movement was all exactly the same and they said was it accurate and i said well it looked as though you were getting exactly the same answers to what you got before and yet we were blindfolded which is amazing were it not for the fact that when you were blindfolded i turned the ouija board around so all the answers were just complete rubbish wow effectively you have to be seeing the ouija board to get the messages out and because of that and because of the contact with the planchette yeah, I'm very, very sceptical. You know, there's this huge history that Sarah's pointed out going back to the Chinese and even, you know, other oracle devices that are using in ancient Greece as well. So it's an amazing history to it. I actually ended up going to university at Washington College on the Eastern Shore, um, uh, Chesapeake Bay area, um, in a town called Chestertown, where the original developer of the Ouija board, the Parker Brothers Ouija board, lived. Wow. Wow. Um, by pure coincidence, I had no idea that was the case before I went to the university. But yeah, fascinated by it. 
that skeptical. Wow. Absolutely. So, I mean, so you basically said in the beginning that would be that was basically used as a psychological tool. That's the same thing that Shelley was asking. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah. But there's, a, but there's another there's another caveat, though. People often say to me, you know, would you advise using a Ouija board? Mm -hmm. And it might seem counter to what I believe about Ouija boards. But I often say no. Don't use a Ouija board, because if you believe that the Ouija board is contacting spirit or you believe that by doing it, it's a doorway to something negative, then you using it could mean that things that happen to you afterwards, you might attribute to that spirit or to the open doorway and letting bad things in. So therefore, even though I don't believe it is doing that, if you believe it is, I wouldn't advise using it if you're genuinely scared by it. I, yeah. Why would I? That wouldn't be that wouldn't be ethical then, would it? Yeah, That's you see, not. one thing that I'll say, and AJ knows this, Kieran, I will not, I never have done and I never will use one. Right. But they're the one tool in this whole field and I've I've used many many tools. Uh, I, I even I even work with one, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I don't believe. And I tell you the, re the main reason because if you put your finger on the planchette, right? Yeah. And everybody has their fingers on it. You're putting supposedly putting energy into the planchette. Yes. Right. Yeah. So. Then, when that planchette's moving, yeah. if everybody at the same time was to lift their fingers off, it would stop. Now, surely there should be enough energy in that to carry on. Maybe, maybe yeah. not for long, yeah. but maybe to, to finish spell on a name or... I, I yes. don't know whether I'm right or not. That's my, my view of it. Well, there was some research that was done back in the 1850s by Faraday of all people, a scientist who showed that it was micromotor muscular movement. And basically mm. what that is, is it's subconscious movement. So if you're touching the planchette, the best way to illustrate it is if you're touching the planchette and, and you're saying, what's the name of the spirit here? And it goes to J and then O and then H. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the next letter is going to be N. We yeah. know that. Your brain knows that because it's been exposed to that name before. Because of that, your brain communicates with the muscles in your arm, your wrist and your fingers to move that planchette to N. But the brain does that bypassing your consciousness. So it does that without you realizing because it's an automatic process. So therefore, when you ask people, did you move it? People would genuinely go, no, of course I didn't because they genuinely feel as though they didn't move it, but because your brain is bypassing your consciousness of it mm. and it's basically communicating with the finger and going, no, move it to N, of course it's going to be N. But now you've got everybody around the table and they're all doing the same thing. So they all feel like it's not moving. And that's why it's such an effective tool, because you yeah. can be sitting around the table doing that and all feel like, we're not moving it. We're genuinely not moving it. It almost feels like it's taking itself. Just fantastic. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, Karen, you know, I, I, I know you have to uh, get out of here. We were going to have you on definitely again, um, whenever you're free in the next few weeks or whenever you'd like to come back out. We would love to continue this conversation. I'll actually leave my question for the next time. Um, and real quick, Sarah, I, I'm sure you were just answering that. But uh, have you ever been to the Paranormal Research Center in Hinckley yet? No, I haven't yet, but I do know the owner, and I've spoken to Paul Stevenson at Haunted Magazine, who I know has been there many, many times. So I've had a, an open invitation, so at some point I'll make it. Awesome. Well, before you go, can you just give all of us investigators some tips or a tip that we could use in the field with us to be more effective and be more um, thorough in what we're doing, if you could? I don't know if you have any. Well, it's yeah, it's very, it's very tough because everybody has different ways of, of ghost hunting. The only thing I would say is two, two quick tips is read. So one is read. I mean, there's so much stuff out there. There are guidelines. There's some early research by Harry Price, one of the ghost hunters in the UK, and some of the stuff he did and the way he approached investigations. The Society for Psychical Research based in um, London and also the Ghost Club, they publish various guidelines and, and you know, how to do ghost hunting. So do read and get familiar with all of that stuff. As t in terms of a personal tip, the only thing I would say is two things. Number one, temperature. 
find a good way of recording temperature because it's one of those things that we rec we report a lot mm. when we're having these ghostly experiences and if you've got some way of capturing temperature effectively mm -hmm. you can therefore have that kind of double validation that you mentioned earlier aj which is that you've got somebody reporting there's a cold spot but you're measuring it accurately and you can do that quite cheaply you know there are various thermometers you can use to measure that cold spot but also it's useful to measure the temperature of people because mm. if they are also reporting a drop in temperature you've got that so that's the thing i would say and the last thing is is a is a shout out to parapsychologists as well as you guys which is i'm incredibly grateful to the two of you for me coming on to your show because oh. i think i think we should talk more and i oh, say well, you two I and me but also all ghost mm. hunters out there parapsychologists who are doing the science stuff you know stuck in our ivory towers we don't tend to get out into the field and i'm an exception but we publish all of the stuff which is interesting but also we've got so much to learn from you guys in terms of what you do out in the field so if anything this is kind of a last speech on on my soapbox to say yeah let's let's talk more absolutely absolutely, absolutely. Well, we'll have you on many times if you want, yeah, Karen. Absolutely. I mean, I you can be our, you can be our our <laughs> resident uh, our resident. Join the podcast. You know what I'm saying, Karen? Join the podcast. Resident skeptic. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, well, I mean, if you if you want, you you tell us when you're free. If you want to come on once a month or something like that, there, that's that's totally fine. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, there's so much we can learn and, and stuff we could show too and have your opinion on it because we're all you know i think it's so important that nowadays we've, we're so conflicted in this world like have someone's opinion and and on this show we're all about someone's opinion and someone's research and anything like that because i believe even if it's a beginner um like me and robin both agree with we can learn and further our research by learning from either experiences or stuff that you know you have learned through your research and, and studies and I just think working together like that, instead of making this into such a competition that people are making it into um, nowadays, especially with YouTube and everything, I just think there's so much we can learn from each other working together, yeah. you know? Absolutely. We're all citizen scientists at the end of the day. We're all going out there doing science, really, observing, you know, recording, using gadgets or whatever approach we're doing. There's an observational aspect to it, which is always a scientific starting point. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here and before you go, um, Dawn again said, um, obviously, don't forget to check out your online amazing programs in psych parapsychology. Thanks, Dawn. You, where they can find those, please. And also um, that link below, the link tree, if they want to look it down there, please go to Kieran down there and tell them that we sent you. But go ahead, Kieran. Um, shout out where they can find those programs. And, and, and anything else as well, Kieran, websites or anything. Yeah, definitely. So if you go to that link tree link there, you'll find a link to my new book that came out this week actually ghosted awesome. which is about ghost research so that came out this week you've got a, a link on that link tree website to my um courses the school of parapsychology um, dot equid dot com so it's an online parapsychology school but also there's a page on the link tree for my research articles as well um but yeah any of that and i'm grateful to to dawn who's a current student of the school yeah. doing uh, one of the parapsychology courses but there's courses on demonology poltergeist exorcism possession ghost hunting you name it any that of those courses too so yeah very cool well, you guys heard it first on Talking with the Source. Kieran, thank you so much for coming on again. We can't wait to have you on, on again. So we'll be in contact through email. Um, Ella Jace, we're going to um, obviously uh, get back to you. We'll also send it to Kieran after reviewing it, see what he thinks, the people that he could send it to. And I'm sure that he'll be reaching out personally. If he's too busy, we'll just reach out through our email at talkingwiththesource at gmail.com. But, Kieran, thank you so much, man. Honestly, so much. Yeah, honestly. I can't thank you enough, and I apologise again. It took so long. Yeah, not at all. But, but we've done it. We've done it now. We've done it. That's the main thing. We've started. We started. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But we are nowhere near finished. Exactly. No There's so much more to talk about. So thank you, AJ. Thank you, Robin. No, not no, a problem. Thank you all the for Been all the pleasure. questions to everybody. Thank you. See you soon. Bye bye. Okay. Well, oh my gosh, that was, you know, I can't believe the hour went by so quick, man. Like, I wanted to keep going because Shelly had some awesome questions that, like, it didn't even cross my mind. I still have questions I didn't even ask. 
Um, you have questions that you didn't even really get to ask because we talked for mo about more I could talk to him all night. I could oh, literally I talk to that guy all night. You know, and, and it's funny because a lot of um, – thank you, Dawn, as well. Dawn says thank you all. Um, thank you, Dawn, for coming on and, and um, you know, and watching us, watching this with us and participating. That's what we truly uh, like. Um, also, Sarah, to our sister, um, you love that, guys. What an awesome podcast. Thank you so much, Sarah. We appreciate you. Um, and Shelly, thank you. Um, please feel free to come back anytime we have. We will be having on more people. We'll be having uh, Dave Schrader on when his new show um, comes on, hopefully. We're also going to be having Patty Negri on again. We're going to be having a lot of different guests as well as local. Um, I'm Kieran. All around the globe. Yes, and Kieran will be on 100% multiple times again. And I, I <clears> really <throat> learned so much. I mean, you know what? Whether the person's scientific or completely skeptical, like I said to Kieran, and, and I've said to you, you know, we can learn so much and further our research by having someone like that question our stuff and 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 further it, you know. So you know what, right? I'm gonna say this now on camera, and I'm not, <clears throat> uh -oh. I'm I'm not no, I'm not He's asking coming. anything like that, right? I'm being I'm being 100 percent serious. Okay, which is not normal for me. Okay. Is I, I love that guy, right? A lot of people yeah. always used to question, is Most Haunted real or is Most Haunted fake? Now, I grew up watching it, right? And I loved it and I believed it. But I'm going to tell you now, yeah. if that gentleman there that was just been on, Dr. Kieran O'Keefe, if he has associated himself with that, then as far as I'm concerned, it's real. No, I mean he told you straight out. He told yeah, you straight out. Yeah, it's that he he is the is the most genuine guy you will in this field you will ever meet. Yeah. No, awesome. I mean, right. He's been so like helpful with all the things we've been dealing with and you've been dealing with emergency wise and rescheduling. I mean, for him being so busy to come on two days after, I mean, it's just he's just awesome. I mean, we got to talk to him a little bit before this and you know what? I just totally cool. I can't wait to have him on again, man. So you know, I'm yeah, glad. Yeah, and not only that, but when I started, when I joined up with you on this, and I started booking in guests, he was always one. And you know, I've been emailing him, trying to get a hold of him. Absolutely. So yeah. honestly, I, that that guy is amazing, and uh, you know, whoever he goes to work for, they'll, they'll only flourish. Yeah. No, I I totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, Doofus, I want to say to you, I apologize. You did say chi, and I totally apologize about that. I can't see on YouTube a picture, so we don't know exactly who, who it is except for Facebook. I don't know why that is. So I very do apologize. I did not mean any disrespect by that. Um, and, yes, sir, I remember Ghost Watch. I was actually just watching. I don't. He doesn't remember it. But, yeah, it scared, scared me. And I just watched it like a couple of months ago. Um, but – you know, we just appreciate everybody watching. We want all of our viewers to get involved, ask questions like you've seen. Um, it's very important to us because if we have somebody on like Patty Negri or, you know, Zach Bagans or anything, like anyone who's in that field, like Kieran or someone who's been on a TV show. And, and obviously not everyone gets to have a conversation with those people. And there's so many questions that people like Shelly can ask to, like I said, further our research and also Kieran's. Um, so please, uh, you know, join us every week. We have another show that's going to be coming up Saturday um, with Kevin uh, Williams of Red Ridge Paranormal. Um, so please join us on Saturday. I'm not too sure exactly the time. I'd have to look at my notes, but just go on our social medias on uh, Talking with the Source on Facebook, Twitter, um, also YouTube. We just started um, putting our stuff on YouTube. But if you want to watch all older episodes, you can go right on our Facebook. We have everything from even before this was named Talking with the Source, um, and before this really became a serious podcast. But uh, you, again, thank you guys so much, and uh, to Dr. Kieran O'Keefe. Absolutely. And also, for everybody watching as well, if you ever want to have a little bit of the male AJ dressed as a woman, will you just shout out the street corner on? <laughs> Listen, don't don't make me don't make me put that hat picture on of you. If you guys watch this, basically what you're gonna see is me and him constantly making fun of each other. It's all in fun and games, uh, so don't mind us. We get a little uh, stupid sometimes, but it's all in fun and games. Yeah, no, you. Oh, see, I pointed at myself. Damn it! No, exactly. I forgot it's reversed. I forgot it was reversed. Um, but anyway, guys, this has been another episode of Talking with the Source. Um, 
We're going to show a couple of videos before we end this completely. But thank you guys so much again. I'm AJ from Coventry Circle Paranormal. And you never give a shout out to our big friends, Mr. and Mrs. AAP I leave from it up. AAP's Variety Channel. Check Got them it. out. As far as I'm aware, they're actually live now on oh, YouTube. Awesome. Yeah, Check them out. Channel or you guys have uh, YouTube, anything, please head over to Mr. and Mrs. A or a AAP Variety Channel is what it's called on YouTube. You could, they allow you to share your channel. They help pollinate your channel, share it out to thousands of people. So tell them Robin and AJ send you. I know. Absolutely. So uh, appreciate you guys so much. And we will definitely be seeing you on Saturday. So talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.